Children's Symposium. Um, our first speaker today is Chris Dempsey, and as you can see, his title is up here. Chris is a faculty member at Gannon University. Ready? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so today what I'm going to do is talk to you guys a little bit about a project that uh, myself, uh, Greg Andrezo, and then Michelle Coons have uh, been carrying out since 2016. Uh, and what we're going to do today is tell you guys a little bit about um, a five-year summary of water quality changes in uh, Presque Isle Bay. Uh, we do have, obviously, 2022 data. It's been a long-term project, uh, but we decided just to keep it focused on five years uh, so that we could present things consistently uh, today. So I'm going first, Greg will go second, tell you guys a little bit about the uh, fish part of this. Uh, before we jump into this, um, I'd like to make uh, a number of acknowledgements. Uh, I'd like to thank both the biology and chemistry departments and then our dean's office um, over at Gannon uh, for providing support uh, for this particular project. Um, we've had numerous students, uh, that have, a lot of students that have helped us out over the last six years from biology, freshwater marine biology programs. Um, we've also had RSC interns that help us out quite a bit during the summertime um, in terms of collecting um, a lot of the data that we have here today. Um, and then I'd like to thank uh, LICOR for providing money for our uh, light sensors that we use. And then uh, the Dr. and Mrs. Arthur William Phillips Charitable Trust has provided support for some of the uh, instrumentation that we have in the labs uh, that helps us to analyze some of this data. Okay. So uh, our long-term objective uh, is to be able to kind of assess water quality and biological changes in Presque Isle Bay. Uh, I just roughly put in there 30 years, uh, probably until Greg or I retire or die, one of those two things. And so uh, hopefully by the time he's ready to retire, I know all the fish and can kind I'm of keep it. 30 years. I'm not giving you 30 years. So. I feel like I've got to get at least 10 years out of him, and then I, I don't know what's going to happen after that. So we'll see. So I don't want to commit him to anything, though. So I just put 30 years up there. Uh, you know, I, I think I'll be going for at least another 20, 25 years or so. So uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, maybe I should start shrinking that number every time I, I, do, I do this presentation. But uh, in general, Presque Isle Bay, I think most of you are familiar with it. It's a pretty large system. Um, just some basic stats up there. Um, its approximate mean depth uh, is about six meters. Um, and what you guys will see today is that almost all of our sampling, we're just focusing on the top five meters, uh, mostly just because I don't want our equipment getting stuck in the mud or having to deal with those kinds of things. Um, generally speaking, uh, we, we, we think of it as being a well-mixed system. Um, it doesn't typically stratify. It, we do get occasional incipient stratification. I think over the last six years, at our sampling location, um, we've had it go uh, stratified maybe like three times in six years. Those typically happen during the summertime on very calm uh, or no-wind days. Uh, but I will say that uh, just from various sampling in the bay, I have gotten stratification in some of the smaller uh, embankments. Um, and then in some of the shallower areas closer to shore, I've also seen some incipient stratification as well. Uh, but generally speaking, I think the bay is a pretty well-mixed system. Um, and so most of our YSI data is typically pretty uniform uh, from top to bottom. Okay. Uh, here is kind of our sampling location. And so what we've been doing is going out to this spot uh, about the middle of each month. Um, you'll see on our data uh, that most of our data uh, does uh, go from about May through November of each year. Uh, there are some day, some months or years where we're able to get out a little bit earlier and um, take advantage of uh, a private boat to be able to go out and collect some of the water quality data. And there are some winters when the ice is thick enough, we'll actually walk out to our spot, drill a hole, and then we'll collect uh, our water quality and plankton data there. And so this is the approximate location that we go to um, each month, and then that's where we collect our samples just to kind of give you guys a point of reference. Okay. Uh, we collect a whole bunch of data, uh, so I, uh, uh, today what I'm going to be doing is talking mostly about the water quality data, so that will be some light data, uh, temperature, pH, oxygen, uh, I left off specific conductivity, but I do have it in my slides, and then I collect is organic carbon data, and so I'll talk to you guys a little bit about that. Uh, we also collect plankton and fish data, Greg's going to tell you about the fish today, and then we take advantage of the Environaut, and so that's typically in the water from at some point in May, and then we typically pull it out, usually the first or second week of November. Um, and so I think we're going out next Monday will be our last sampling event for this particular, this year, unless we get ice in December, so. Okay. Uh, just some of our methods, just to let you guys know how we're collecting this. So we obviously go out to our site, uh, we anchor up, uh, and uh, usually what we do is we kind of break up into teams to be able to collect the various, uh, various things that you see up there, the various parameters. Uh, so we do use a YSI. Uh, for 2016 and 17, we were using a YSI Quattro, uh, but we've switched over to a Pro D Pro DSS, uh, which allows us to collect uh, collect samples at one second intervals through the water column. 
And so we collect two profiles, I typically average them together, and again, it's just the top five meters or zero to five meters is where we're, is where we're collecting those. And you guys can see the parameters that we're collecting. Um, it is calibrated daily, um, and so uh, and then uh, we collect the data electronically and then obviously import it. Uh, we collect light data in two different ways. Uh, so one, we use a sec standard seconiness, um, and so that's obviously, it's a very old fashioned but useful technique that kind of allows us to quickly assess uh, transparency in the water column. But then we also use uh, LICOR PAR sensors. Um, and so here's a picture over here on the right hand side. Um, we use one that's mounted up um, to collect uh, upward, downward welling irradiance. And then we have one that's also facing down just to collect scattering, but I haven't actually done anything with the scattering data yet. Um, and then what we do with our PAR data, uh, we collect two profiles. Uh, each time we do this, uh, we convert our PAR profiles into extinction coefficients or KD values. And then what I'm going to show you guys today are what we call Z1% values, which is just the point in the water column at which there's about 1% of the light left from the surface. Okay. And then we also collect uh, dissolved organic carbon data. So we do measurements at 0, 2, 4, and 5 meter depths. And so from that, we're able to get a DOC concentration. And then I also do some qualitative data. Today, I'll show you guys some data uh, about spectral slope ratios and uh, the SUVA 320 value, which behaves very similar to SUVA 254. It's a common water quality parameter. We'll give you some more information about those a little bit later. Okay, okay so uh, I'm gonna walk you guys through our results. Um, most of my figures are gonna look pretty much the same uh, in terms of how they're laid out. So I'll spend a little bit of time on my first one just to kind of orient you uh, to uh, what's going on in there. And then we'll kind of take a look at all of these different trends over the last five years. And I'm gonna stick to this kind of order where we'll go over the YSI data first, then we'll jump into the light, and then we'll finish up with the dissolved organic carbon. Okay. So we're gonna take a look at the temperature data first. Um, obviously the parameter will be on the Y axis. And then what we did along the X axis is just put, uh, we, put uh, we broke the year down into quarters and then put the months. And then in between each of the dashed lines are just the years across the top. So obviously it's 2016, it's unlabeled, but then you go up to 2021. And then uh, there's a couple of things going on in each of these graphs. Uh, so uh, the dashed line there, uh, I believe that's a gray line. Uh, that is uh, the average, just so you guys can see how each data point compares back to the average. The black solid line that you guys see would just be a linear trend line through the entire data set. And then down at the bottom of each of the graphs, um, it did report uh, the mean and the standard deviation for the entire data set that we have. And then uh, every year is just a little bit different, um, but um, uh, you can see that there are some months where we get out in the winter time. So you can see in 2018, we obviously got out in January and February to collect samples under the ice. Okay, do keep in mind that those winter samples can be driving some of these trends um, that, you, that we see. Um, and then uh, there are some months where we got out, some years where we got a little bit late. Uh, and so in 2020, we got a slight late start due to COVID. And so I don't think we collected our first sample until maybe, I think we got out in June or July. July was our first one in 2020. So, but generally speaking, like I said, we do typically are in the water in May. Um, and then our last sample is typically November. And so here you guys can see for temperature, right, we have a mean temperature of about 16.5 degrees, uh, quite a bit of variability over the course of the year, which you would expect uh, based on where we are in latitude here on Earth. Uh, and generally speaking, what we're starting to see um, is uh, over the five year period is we're seeing that the bay is starting to warm. Uh, the summer peak temperatures have been fairly consistent for the last couple years, but if you pay attention or look carefully, what's happening is the bay is warming up a little bit faster and it's cooling down a little bit slower on the back end. And so that's mostly what's driving that average temperature increase, uh, temperature increase in the bay. Okay. Here's dissolved oxygen. Uh, we do see a slight decrease over the last five years in terms of oxygen. Uh, that would make sense as the temperature is increasing, um, and so we think that's what's most likely driving that. But just like temperature, you see a very seasonal cycle uh, where oxygen tends to uh, drop during the summertime as the temperature is warm, and then it's obviously higher when the water temperature is colder. Okay. This is what our pH data looks like. We are seeing a decrease in the pH uh, over the last five years. And so typically back in 2016 and 17, those values were up maybe around like 8, 8.5. Uh, what we're noticing, at least in 2021, that as our values have dropped below that average, and we're typically hovering around maybe 7.5 to 7 uh, for our pH values. Okay. Next, we'll take a look at the specific, specific conductivity. Um, I think generally, my, my, big, my big takeaway from this is that it looks like it's staying fairly stable. I think most of this trend is being driven by that one outlier in 2017. 
And so that sample was collected in April of 2017. Um, it, it was a clear sunny day. I don't remember if there was significant rainfall beforehand, but that may have been possible. I do need to go back and look at the weather data to see what might be driving that really high value. But generally speaking, our conductivity values are staying around 350 uh, microsiemens per centimeter. Okay. So let's take a look at the light, light data. So two different ways to look at the light data. One is just the Secchi disk. Um, keep in mind, Secchi disk is a great way to assess the transparency. But oftentimes, the Z1% value is about two to three times deeper than the Secchi disk. And so this will become much more transparent when we move to the next slide. But what we're seeing is an average Secchi disk reading of about two meters in the bay. Um, and uh, we see a very common cycle in the bay where typically in June, uh, the bay is typically the clearest. Um, and so for those people that have fished in the area, um, it tends to be fairly dark in the spring, but then it goes through a clearing in June. Uh, before biological productivity starts to take over uh, as we move into the summer and then the bay becomes darker as we start to move into late summer and fall. And so we typically see that in most years where June is the clearest um, and then the spring and the fall are typically darker waters in the bay. Okay? And so this is where things get really interesting is uh, the light of the PAR data. So these are Z1% values. Right? And so the Z1% value is the depth at which about 1% of the light is making it to the bottom. So I have depth over here on the Y axis. Okay? And so uh, keep in mind that the bay is only six meters deep. So one big picture takeaway is that for the first three years of the data, uh, light is making it well past the bottom of the bay, which means there's enough light to be able to support photosynthesis throughout the entire water column. But as you guys can see, in 2020 and 2021, things have become a little bit more interesting. The bay has darkened up quite a bit, and I'll show you why that's happening, or one idea as to why that's happening on the next few slides. Uh, but this is something that's a really noticeable change in our data set, where we had light making it all the way to the bottom in the first you know, three, three and a half years of our data set. And then in 2020, 2021, the bay has become quite a bit darker. One of the reasons we think that might be happening is that uh, the DOC concentrations have been going up in the bay. And so uh, dissolved organic carbon, um, uh, it's obviously the organic material that's in the water column. You guys can see here that we have an average of about three, but as you come into 2020 and 2021, you can see that a lot of our values are higher than what we see back in 2017, 18, and 19. And so we do see an upward kick in DOC concentration uh, and so I have not plotted out the 2022 data to see if we've returned back to some normal level or if we're continuing to increase. But these elevated DOC concentrations could be a really good reason to explain why our light data, why the, lake, why the bay is becoming quite a bit less, less, less transparent. Sorry. Okay. And then the last two things I'll show you are just some DOC quality data. So two metrics that I pulled out for today are what is called the spectral slope ratio. Uh, the spectral slope ratio is just a ratio of the slope. We generate these from absorbance scans, so we collect absorbance data from 800 to 200 nanometers. Um, and then the spectral slope ratio is a ratio of the slope of the line uh, from uh, 275 to 295 over 350 to 400. And what the spectral slope ratio gives us an idea about is how photo bleached the dissolved organic carbon is, which just means if it's been exposed to sun or not exposed to sun. And it also tells us a little bit about the molecular weight of the dissolved organic carbon, whether it's high or low. And so they're very broad qualitative measurements. But as you guys can see up here, as we start to shift to lower spectral slope ratios, what that's indicating is that the DOC that's coming into Presque Isle Bay is less photo bleached and it's a higher molecular weight. And so those are two things that are important to keep in mind as we think about not only the concentration of DOC, but also the quality. And then the last metric that I'll show you that kind of ties into the DOC quality as well would be the SUVA 320 value. I just used this. It's very similar to the SUVA 254 value, which is reported on um, um, common water quality reports. I use 320 just because it's within a, uh, the normal wavelengths of light that hit the, hit the surface of the bay. And what you guys can see with SUVA 320 is that the SUVA 320 value is increasing over our five-year data set. Um, and as you guys can see up at the top, as we start to shift to a higher SUVA value, it indi indicates that we're getting uh, more colored terrestrial dissolved, terrestrial derived dissolved organic carbon, which means that uh, more of our carbon is coming from the watershed. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of give you guys a sense of what's going on. 
So some big picture takeaways uh, from this data set. I know this is like a really broad overview. We obviously have a lot of data. We can start to ask some really interesting questions with it. Um, in terms of what we're observing with our YSI data, obviously we're seeing an increase in temperature uh, and then a decrease in dissolved oxygen. pH has decreased and specific conductivity appears to be remaining stable. Um, in terms of our light data, big picture takeaways, we are seeing that light reaches the bottom of the bay or close to the bottom of the bay in all months. Um, the bay is most transparent during June, and then typically we're seeing that it's becoming uh, uh, darker over the rest of the sampling period. But in recent last two years, uh, 2020, 2021, we're seeing that the bay is becoming darker. And then in terms of that, uh, DOC concentration is obviously increasing, and we're seeing some changes in the spectral slope ratio in the SUVA 320. Um, so spectral slope decreasing, and SUVA 320 is increasing. Um, bringing potentially more terrestrial divide DOC into the water, which is darkening it, uh, which could have some implications down the road for temperature and light transparency um, as well. Okay. And so um, I will stop there, but if anybody has any questions, I think we've got a few minutes left, I'll be happy to do my best to answer any questions. Questions for Dr. Dempsey? I, I, it's a good question. I don't have a great idea. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't, ha I don't have the answer to that yet. That could be what's going on. Um, it could also, uh, yeah. I've been thinking about that for a while. I don't have a good answer yet, so that could be what's going on, though. That's pretty interesting. Other questions? We could probably get that pretty easily um, via satellite data, or I'm sure somebody has a local record of it. We have not been keeping it um, for the Bay. I mean, I will say that in, uh, in 2000, so I think 2018 was the last year we were able to walk. We did get on the, on the ice uh, this, this past February, so 2022, but we were not able to get out on the ice in 2021, 20, or 19. So 2018 was the last time that we were able to get out there. Um, and so we can get the ice data. I don't have a, a complete record of that. Some of you know, the, the winter is changing more. Yes. You know, the, the max isn't really changing as much in the summer. Right. What's happening. In the winter is really important. Yeah, Absolutely. Really yeah, yeah. Yep, that's a good point. Yep. Sure. Oops, cut. Well, you go first, and then do that. So, I mean, if, if you're, what you're trying, like your question is if we didn't have them, would we still? Uh, I think yes, we still would, because we're not seeing like maximum temperatures in the summer go really all that much higher for the last five years. It's really the temperatures in the spring and the fall that are driving the overall change of that trend line that I presented. And so I think what's happening, kind of like what Courtney was saying here too, is that, uh, is that our, mostly what's happening during the winter. If we don't get ice cover in the winter, the bay is staying warmer in the winter. Um, so it's our springs and our falls that are essentially warming faster than the, faster than the summer. So, yes. Why do you think the increase in the DOC concentration? Yep, so I think uh, there could be three things that are driving that. Number one, in the northeastern part of the United States, we've seen just generally speaking across most aquatic ecosystems, uh, DOC concentration has been increasing. Uh, most long-term records do show that in the Northeast. That's mostly uh, a result of uh, recovery from um, acid mine drainage. Uh, so, not acid mine drainage, sorry, acid rain, sorry about that. Uh, and then um, two other things that could be driving it. Number one uh, might be uh, these more extreme storm events that are occurring um, that might be uh, causing more stuff from the landscape to come in. And then another potential idea that I need to look into a bit is how the water levels of the lake have changed over the last couple of years. We've had some very high years and then some years where it's dropping. And so that could be another reason that ties into, ties into that. But those are probably three big picture ideas that might be driving that DOC concentration. How do you uh, separate the dissolved organic carbon from carbon that might be in a biotic entity? Water yes. Okay, so I do. I go through a 0.7 micron filter. I did not oh. mention that, but I do filter. 
And then in terms of, so the qualitative data is where you can start to tease out whether the DOC is more terrestrial or whether it's being produced in the system. And so like if you had a, if you had like a, uh, where is it, spectral slope data, oh, I don't know what's going on, but uh, whoop, that's the concentration data. Uh, but in, you can start to use some of the qualitative metrics to tease out if the DOC is being produced more inside the system or if it's coming from the watershed. Okay, I'd be curious, you know, with the huge amounts of phytoplankton yeah, absolutely. In, the day, in, the, in the summer months, yes. it could be from dying diatoms. Absolutely. And organic carbon leaching out of the cells. You're absolutely right. And do keep in mind that these values are extremely low. Like where the spectral slope values are, like in the grand scheme of spectral slope values across aquatic ecosystems, they're on the side of being more produced inside of the bay. And so I'm not, I, sh I should have mentioned that, is that those values are uh, more consistent with like autochthonous production. And so if you, but so what we're seeing though is a shift towards more terrestrial input. But again, look at the, I mean, the scale's not very, usually spectral slope values range between, I wanna say like zero and six. Um, and so we're on the lower end of that which would indicate that those are more like microbial produced or inside of the system is how we would interpret that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Our next speaker is Greg Andrasso from Gannon University with a five-year summary of open water fish community in Presque Isle Bay. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, I'd like to just piggyback on uh, the presentation that Chris just gave, uh, following up with some of the biotic uh, data that we've generated uh, since our study started in 2016, uh, specifically talking about the fish community in the open waters of Presque Isle Bay, uh, which certainly differs from the near shore, heavily vegetated uh, uh, environment. So that open water fish community. Uh, so, like Chris mentioned, in case we just had somebody that walked in, uh, we started in 2016 a long-term monitoring project of the bay, a bunch of water quality and water chemistry work, VO, pH, conductivity, VOC, things Chris just talked about, but then biological sampling as well. Each time we go out, we do some vertical plankton toes. Michelle Coons has headed up that work, um, and then uh, bottom trawl for fish, and that's what I'll be talking about today. So I just wanted to mention here, to tie in some of the things Chris talked about with the fish community. Chris showed this, uh, uh, this figure uh, over that uh, five-year period, what's going on with uh, dissolved oxygen, or DO, and uh, our long-term trend line there, the long-term average rate about uh, 10 parts per million. What's that mean uh, for fish? Uh, here's a figure for you just generally. Uh, 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 DO uh, concentrations above about nine parts per, uh, per million supports abundant uh, 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 fish uh, communities. Uh, and it's not until we get down uh, below about five parts per million that we start to see deleter uh, deleterious uh, uh, effects. So, you know, that DO data uh, suggests uh, good, uh, good conditions uh, for fish and that that hasn't really changed across time. So our methodology here, we use the uh, research vessel Environaut. Uh, we do a bottom trawl. Uh, if you're not familiar with the process, we drag a large net along the bottom. Uh, there are doors uh, that take it down. They sort of cut apart from one another and cut down in the water column. And we should be scratching along the bottom uh, as we go. Uh, we have a winch system aboard the boat. This is not a large trawl, it's about 16 feet uh, wide, uh, sort of a typical uh, experimental trawl. Uh, fish uh, uh, enter the trawl, get uh, swept back towards the cod end of the net uh, where there's a liner that's quarter inch mesh. Uh, so we could capture some pretty small fish that way. Uh, we have a winch system aboard the boat. Uh, here we're hauling our trawl back on board. Well, we get the fish on board, we have a live well system set up where we're circulating water uh, from the bay and we're uh, uh, pumping a lot of air through it as well, try to keep it as aerated as possible. Uh, we count every fish, uh, take it down to species level, and then for many species, the uh, ones of interest, uh, things like our centrarchids, right, bluegills and crappies and, and uh, our perch, and if we get a walleye, 
uh, several other species, we actually measure their, their total length. So not only do we have numbers data, but we have fish length data uh, well, for quite a few species. So we do this monthly. Uh, we run the same path as much as possible uh, month after month, try to eliminate that as a variable. Uh, that's about 700 meters long. Uh, it's a 10-minute trawl. Uh, Captain Sam uh, Polson aboard the Environaut, uh, independent of what the wind's doing, that 10-minute trawl uh, varies by about 20 meters. And our start and end points are within, like, feet of one another. So we're pretty much, uh, we're taking that same path uh, uh, month to month. Okay. Uh, here's sort of, a, uh, in a nutshell, the species uh, that we have collected over that uh, five-year period. Here, to try to keep it consistent among years, here's data uh, for July through November for 2017 uh, through 2021. Uh, you can see there uh, a lot of fish have been counted, 20,000 individuals. Uh, almost all of them get returned to the bay unless we have another project going on. Uh, there's 20 species and 11 families. Uh, the centrarchids uh, are the uh, uh, most abundant in terms of number of species. Uh, and a couple things I just really want to point out, we'll do more with here. If we look at percent catch data, we could see a bay that's really dominated by the yellow perch, about 63% of our catch. Uh, white perch, which we'll talk a little bit uh, more about, about 18% of the catch. We see round gobies, uh, and then uh, a couple of our shiner species also being relatively abundant, but really dominated by a few species, yellow perch, white perch, uh, and round goby. Uh, here's just a pie uh, graph showing that, get a little better feel of the relative abundance of those three, uh, I'm sorry, of those species. Uh, the seven species I labeled there together combined make up uh, uh, over 97% of the catch. So uh, uh, we don't have a really diverse uh, fish community in the open waters uh, of the bay. Uh, like I mentioned, we get 20 total species, uh, but uh, uh, they tend to be relatively rare uh, in our catch. So what I'm going to do is focus on uh, those seven species that I have labeled there. Take a look at what they're doing uh, across that five-year uh, period, uh, maybe hit a little bit at their ecological relevance. So just kind of a snapshot of what we've been doing. Uh, we can mine into these data a lot more. Uh, I also want to point out we'd like to make this data set available to people who, who might be interested in modeling or, or using it for, for various reasons. Okay. So uh, here's richness. That's simply the number of fish species collected on each of our dates. Again, uh, these are the, really the, the Chris generated these graphs across that five-year period. You t we tend to see some fluctuation seasonally, where generally, I think we could say, our richness increases in midsummer, uh, goes down a little bit later in the season, but some seasonality there. Uh, 2020, if you remember Chris's data, 2020 seemed like a weird year, and it wasn't just because of COVID. Um, <laughs> so something strange seemed to be, have the base seemed to start kind of changing uh, in 2020. We saw that in his data, uh, and we'll see some of that here uh, as well. All right, here's Shannon uh, diversity index. So the Shannon index takes into account not only how many species are present, but uh, how equally they're represented in the catch. So if you had a large number of species that all made up the same percentage of the catch, you'd have a high index. Uh, if you had few species, that were dominated by one or two, we'd have a low Shannon index. And then we also plot evenness here, and evenness is a measurement of how high is your observed Shannon value compared to how high it could possibly be with that number of species. So with that amount of richness, what's our sort of relative Shannon value? And you see the long-term trend is quite low, our uh, evenness is only about 0.15. That means it's only about 15% as high as it possibly could be with that number of species collected. So what's kind of driving that relatively low Shannon index uh, and low evenness? There's 2020 again. We'll see why that 
we'll see why that is. That, that uh, relatively high Shannon index there, I'll tell you the punchline here, was due to relatively low numbers of yellow perch uh, in that year. So we'll hit two species here. These are our two most uh, abundant species in our catch, the yellow perch and the white perch. That's the problem with common names. They're even of different families, uh, certainly different genera, right? The yellow perch is native uh, to North America. The white perch uh, is native to coastal areas and then uh, is a non-native. It made its way into the Great Lakes through the Erie Canal system up the Hudson River across Erie Canal and the Lake Ontario, then uh, through the Welland Canal into the, into the upper Great Lakes. Uh, first, the white perch was first reported uh, in Lake Erie in 1953. Uh, and there was a lot of concern about white perch like in the 80s, outcompeting yellow perch and displacing yellow perch. It hasn't seemed to have happened, uh, uh, at least in, in these waters. The yellow perch is currently receiving a lot of attention. Uh, if you catch a yellow perch out on Lake Erie now, it's almost like you, you've caught a trophy, right? Uh, people aren't even fishing for yellow perch most of the time in the open waters uh, of the lake. Um, sorry. Okay. And we see here, uh, this is uh, uh, data from the OD, Ohio DNR uh, looking at uh, sort of hatch success across years in the different uh, regions of Lake Erie, roughly the different basins. Uh, of the lake, and we could see the uh, central zone and the eastern zone uh, in recent years, the hatch rate, the hatch success is really low. That's a whole story in itself. I think Mark Halfley from the Fish and Boat Commission, he'd say, hey, when walleye populations are up, yellow perch populations go down, and yellow perch tend to be pretty dynamic in population density. They tend to fluctuate all over the place. So, Kind of what do we see in the, in the bay in terms of yellow perch and white perch? Uh, the yellow perch there in green, uh, the white perch uh, in red. We tend to see some seasonality uh, and we tend to see some variation across years. For example, yellow perch in 2018 were through the roof. Uh, very low numbers, relatively speaking, uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, white perch, kind of overall, uh, we had some big catches in 2017, popped up again in 2019, relatively low in recent years. This year, we don't have the data presented yet, but we'll go out and we'll catch three or four white perch. And in, in the past, uh, we were getting hundreds and hundreds uh, in, uh, in a trawl. So what's going on there? Okay. So not only do we count yellow perch, but we measure them, we measure each individual typically, unless we have a gigantic catch, and then we'll measure about 400 individuals. That allows us to uh, generate uh, size, frequency, distributions. Uh, we see something like this, right? These different peaks are different year classes, so these would be young of the year individuals. Uh, these would be individuals that have gone through one breeding or one growing season plus part of another one, so we'll call those one plus. And then eh, typically, like we've seen a lot of fish as we get out into larger sizes, year classes tend to kind of mush together. We kind of lose resolution. So we're interested in these young of the year and these one plus fish. How many are, are there? And uh, what can we say about their growth rate? What can we say about their size? So here we have different cohorts of fish. So we could go out in one year, catch young of year fish, and then pick them up, that, that cohort up in the next season uh, when they are one plus uh, growing seasons old. And you can see some variation across years. That purple line there, that was our 2018 cohort, really through the roof. We'd go out and get three, three and a half thousand uh, individuals uh, in a trawl. Uh, we could carry them over into year two notice overall. Right, the number of one plus fish, or, or these are all catch per unit effort, number per kilometer uh, trawl, uh, standardizing the data that way. Generally, our one pluses are much less abundant than our uh, young of the year fish, which is interesting itself. And we, some, we see some year to year variation. There's 2020 for us, that light blue line uh, kind of scared the crap out of us. Uh, oh no, as the, as the perch population 
uh, in the Bay, uh, uh, you know, as it crashed. Uh, 2021 kind of caught our breath there. We saw 2021 was a, a relatively very good year. So we see some fluctuations across years. Here's some growth data on these fish. So we could take those young of year fish, measure them, catch them when they're uh, one plus, at least that cohort uh, plot uh, average length of those fish across that first year. The gap, these would be the winter, right, when we are not uh, uh, collecting fish. Typically, uh, we're done in November, and uh, we start usually in June uh, uh, the next year. And we can see across years, fairly consistent, five minutes, uh, uh, in, in both growth rates of the young of the year, they reach about 75 millimeters, and by the end of two years, growth about 120 millimeters. That's some round goby data for you. That's what we see here. Uh, some seasonality uh, tend to peak in those open waters uh, in late summer and then go back down. You don't know what's going on there. They sort of migrating out in the open waters and then turning around or or are uh, fish reaching a size where we're just getting them in our net before that they're just slipping through that quarter inch mesh uh, 2021 we seem to have large numbers okay here's two shiners we could talk shiners probably all day long what's happened to the emerald shiner in the uh in the lake and the bay notice at the very beginning of our sampling in 2016 at least in november we picked up a fair number of emerald shiners and that have been basically non-existent and non-existent in our trawl 2020. The last day we were out there, we ran into a bunch of them, so that's interesting. And then this guy, the Mimic Shiner, uh, large numbers of them showing up the last few years. Uh, is this a sort of replacement of Emerald Shiners with Mimic Shiners? I think there's some debate, maybe uncertainty of what these guys are. I've heard people talk about Sand Shiners in the Bay. Shiner identity is tricky, counting anal fin rays and scales. And, uh, uh, but uh, sort of the guy who wrote the book, at least in Ohio, says, so hey, these are mimic shiners. Okay. And then the last figure, just bluegills and pumpkin seeds. It's interesting, these fish spawn in shallow water. They, they go out into the deeper part of the bay. Uh, in kind of late summer, you'll see catches in July. August, and then typically by the end of the, of the year, October, November, uh, they're, they're gone from the open waters. We think they're heading back into those shallower waters where we uh, reside for the winter. Mm -hmm. So just a snapshot there, summary. What can we say about the bay in general in terms of the open waters? We'd say low richness, low diversity, low evenness, really dominated by yellow perch, white perch, round gobies, some seasonality of various species. Uh, no really apparent uh, changes across uh, that five-year period, except maybe for that mimic shiner uh, increasing in abundance. And overall, if somebody were to ask me, I'd say that the fish community over that period suggests a pretty stable uh, bay environment. Nothing has kind of struck us as, you know, doomsday is coming or anything like that. So I think maybe there's a minute or two for questions. I'm happy to entertain. So that, so that bay is pretty much like a saucer, right? There's not a lot of structure in the middle of it. You have a lot of that five and a half, six meter depth throughout. We think that path that we run is representative of that open water community. You know, we could talk sampling bias and, you know, if you just run into a school of emerald shiner, you know, maybe you get three or four hundred of them. Right. Do we yeah, have any, one high spike right. in 2020? That's, yeah. that's what triggered me to think that. Yeah, do we have any reason to believe that we're more likely to run into a school of them in one year compared to another? Right? Kind of age old ecological sampling questions. Right? Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Can you remind me how deep the water is in the bay or like where you're sampling? So that's about six meters. 
there, maybe a hair over. And we've had a, a little bit of change in water depth, right? A couple of years ago, bay level was really high. Yeah. yeah. And then I just have one more question. Was it an electrified vent install? Or no, just no. We, so, <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious. I know Jay, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah, so that's always an issue, too. Like bigger species, we're trawling. That ends up being about four kilometers an hour, right? Bigger species could get out in front of it, and you're just not getting them, right? right? So there's some bias, gear bias, certainly. Yeah. Um, could human activity influence the changes that you're seeing in 2020 from any of the Yeah, we kind of thought about that. You know, what might be going on there? If people are staying home, is there? more nutrient input into the bay or something like that that could be driving the transparency and, 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 and how much of this system is kind of biologically driven and how much of it is abiotically driven like, like Mike was getting at, you know, the changes in temperature, maybe plankton blooms affecting transparency, affecting DO, affecting zooplankton communities, affecting you know, bait fish moving out into those open water environments or not, right? Th those are the kind of things that we're ultimately trying to get all put together from this giant data set. But I, I would not rule that out. Kind of playing off of that, is there any, do you have, um, like, angler activity records, like field surveys? Because, I mean, even the people might be staying home, the outdoor activity was really spiked in It seems to me yeah. that that bay, certainly the open waters of the bay, are kind of underutilized mm -hmm. as a as a fishery, right? You, you just don't see many people fishing in the open waters of the bay uh, in, in those months. Right? Mm -hmm. Maybe October, November, you have, you have some people trying to catch perch in the bay. Um, so it, it could, but yeah. I, I, think, I think that's pretty consistent, like low fishing pressure in those months throughout that five year period. Yeah. But maybe what's going on in, on in the open waters of the bay affect, or the open waters of the lake affecting this. Yeah. We think that bay's a big, important nursery water, especially for those yellow perch. Because it, it, one plus and then they leave. And you just don't get big perch th throughout that part of the year. Except maybe in May. Thank you again. Chautauqua Lake, and our presenter is Casey Crandall from uh, University of New York, Purdue. Thank you for having me today. So today I'm going to talk about some discontinuous uh, stratification uh, that we found in the south basin of Chautauqua. So first of all, what is stratification? Uh, this is a separation of the water column uh, based on temperature and density differences. Uh, we get a uh, warm surface layer and a cool uh, deep layer that is separated by an area of rapid change. Uh, so officially this is uh, defined as a one degree Celsius change per meter in depth. Uh, and it can be disturbed by environmental factors. Why is this temperature important? So, uh, the temperature uh, environment can affect uh, nutrient cycling within the lake. And so when the lake is stratified, uh, we can get low oxygen conditions in the deep waters, and this can cause chemical reactions that release phosphorus into the water. This phosphorus is usually trapped within this bottom layer while the lake is stratified. However, when that strat uh, stratification breaks down, that phosphorus can be released into the upper layers of the water, and can fuel algal blooms or cyanobacteria blooms. And so understanding the thermal patterns in the lake can help us understand how algae may grow uh, within the lake. So my area of focus was on Chautauqua Lake, and this is a uh, lake with about 53 square kilometer surface area. Uh, it's a dual basin lake, which means it has two distinct areas to it, uh, and it's considered eutrophic. Uh, it produces a lot of algal and plant growth within. What do we currently know about the thermal patterns in this lake? 
So there's been previous uh, temperature work done in the North Basin, uh, and from this work we know that the North Basin consistently stratifies and that the low oxygen conditions are present. However, the North Basin is much deeper than the South Basin with an average depth of about 8 meters and the South Basin having an average depth of about 3.5 meters. Uh, so these graphs, uh, we're going to see several of, of graphs that look like these, so I'll take a minute to get us oriented to them. Uh, going across the x-axis we have time uh, and the y-axis is depth. So at the top of the graph we have the surface of the water and the y-axis will change based on the depth of the sensors that we had deployed. Uh, our temperature scale is in degrees Celsius with our red warmer colors uh, indicating warm temperatures and our blue cooler uh, colors indicating cooler temperatures. So when we look at this graph from the North Basin, we see that there is a distinct warm layer on top, a distinct cool layer on the bottom, and then this area of rapid transition in between. And so this is typically what we see in the North Basin. We have a long-term uh, temperature record from both the North and the South Basin, uh, but this is very um, dispersed data. That it's not consistently um, recorded at high frequency. And so we're wondering, uh, because we saw some different patterns in the North Basin, are we going to see different patterns in the South Basin from what this uh, record shows? So we wanted to verify this vertical temperature trends uh, in the long-term data set and determine if stratification does happen in the South Basin. From the uh, long-term data set, we see that it does not. So we used high-frequency sensors called uh, HOBO sensors, and these are capable of recording data every one second. Uh, we attached multiple <coughs> sensors to a rope, and the rope is attached to an anchor, and these get submerged. It's important to note that we have no sensors in the top two meters of the water column in order to comply with New York State navigational laws. Uh, we left these sensors in place. We actually set them to record at five minutes instead of one second uh, because we get a longer lifespan out of the sensors. We get about 100 days. Doing this, we collect a lot of data. These sensors record about 2,000 data points uh, each week that they're out. And so we're working uh, with trying to figure out how to process this much data. Uh, we've been using our studio, specifically our lake analyzer, to produce our um, graphics and to process this data. So our first deployment in the South Basin. Uh, this was from mid-June to early July, and it was in the north end of the South Basin. We chose this location based on accessibility uh, to a public launch location. Uh, and what we found was that the South Basin is stratifying. We have brief periods where there is a cool uh, deep layer and a warm surface layer. Now this uh, period of stratification does not last long. It lasts uh, maybe a day uh, and then it breaks down. So uh, that's important to know. We do get stratification. We also see periods of rapid uh, temperature swings. So water takes a long time to heat up and cool down. And so we don't expect to see a multiple uh, degree Celsius difference in the matter of a couple of hours, which is what we see right here. So we redeploy the sensors and we see these same patterns existing. We see some stratification events, but we also see more of these rapid temperature swings, both heating up and cooling down. And we wanted to track whether these events were isolated to the one location that we deployed at, or are these happening all over the basin? So we deployed an additional set of sensors so that we had six sensor lines throughout the basin, and these sensors were all taking simultaneous readings. We lined up uh, two sensor lines that were uh, deployed at the same time, so due to logistical reasons we don't have a whole summer's worth of overlapping data, uh, we couldn't feasibly get six lines in and out on the same day. But when we're comparing these, uh, we see that we get the same general patterns with temperature changes, uh, we have stratification events occurring at the same time, but we do see differences in duration and intensity of these stratification events. So at HOBO2, which is our northernmost sensor, we see that uh, the stratification sets up and then just kind of slowly tapers out. In the south basin, or in the south end of the south basin at Smith Boys, we see that the stratification sets up and remains present for a little while, and then all of a sudden just dies out. So there are differences in how these stratification events are occurring. We can also see that these rapid temperature changes 
are not occurring at the same time. So when we line these up, we see that there's a slight offset. And this leads us to believe that there's maybe mass water movement throughout the lake, uh, where there's large uh, portions of water being shifted to, uh, from north to south or south to north. So we put the idea of the mass water movement on the back burner for a little while. We're still working on ways to quantitatively uh, analyze this data. So in the meantime, we were looking back at the stratification. So we wanted to know how often does this lake does this basin stratify, uh, and how stable is the stratification. Uh, so again, stratification is a one degree Celsius change per meter of depth. Uh, as a rough way to analyze whether the uh, lake was stratified, I took the uh, temperature at the bottom sensor, subtracted it from the temperature at the top sensor, and just divided by the depth between those two. So this is a conservative way to analyze whether stratification occurs. Uh, because this is such a shallow basin, this method works for this location. Uh, it wouldn't work for, say, the North Basin because it's much deeper. Uh, this is just the average of temperature change. So if we reach one degree uh, temperature difference per meter, we know that it's going to be stratified. We may miss a couple of times that it stratifies because of this method, uh, but it should give us a rough picture. So in the next slide, I'm going to show a whole bunch of these graphs together. Uh, they're oriented. Uh, north to south, so Hobo 2 being our northernmost sensor, Smith Voice being our southernmost sensor, and they're also oriented east to west. So uh, these are how they would, have, would be seen in the basin. What we can notice is that the stratification events are not occurring at each location. So during this overlapping period, Cheney Point didn't stratify at all. Hobo 2 had brief stratification for maybe a couple of hours. These other sensors stratified uh, for at least a day. And so we're, we can see that uh, the spatial data is going to be important for understanding these temperature patterns. So some mechanisms within the lake. So stratification is a seasonal event in the uh, lakes surrounding here. Uh, and seasonal temperature changes can degrade these density differences to cause mixing. But the uh, mixing can also be caused by things like wind, large precipitation events, and boat traffic. So how this works is uh, wind moving across the surface of the lake could drive water down and can actually drive it deep enough to force that deep layer to uh, mix with the surface layer. And so we were curious, how is wind affecting these patterns that we're seeing? And what we saw was that uh, with Hobo 2 being our northernmost sensor and Smith Boys being our southernmost sensor, when there's a south wind, our northernmost sensor at Hobo 2 tends to be the warmest. When we have a north wind, Hobo 2 tends to be cooler than our southern sensor. So this helps point to masses of water moving throughout our, our basin, uh, with wind being a drive factor in pushing this water around the basin. So these changes in wind direction are differentially affecting uh, the, in, the temperature profiles at opposite ends of the basin. So our key findings. The South Basin, unlike we originally thought, is stratifying. Uh, there are these interesting temperature swings that we're still working on quantitatively analyzing. And the thermal environment of the North and South Basins are quite different. This leads us to believe that there are going to be major chemical differences and ultimately biological differences within these basins. What are our next steps? Uh, we want to work on connecting the North and the South Basins. So they're not uh, two distinct lakes. These are interconnected uh, systems that are having an impact on each other, and we want to see how are those basins uh, cause, causing change within the other. We also want to look at under ice conditions. So we've seen that winter can be driving, uh, changes in winter activity can be driving uh, fall uh, or spring through fall uh, weather. And so we want to see is uh, what's happening in the winter affecting uh, how we see these thermal activities setting them. So I'd like to thank SUNY Fredonia and the biology department for uh, allowing me to do my work, the Holmberg and Falcone Foundation for their funding, uh, Corning and the SUNY 4E Award helped us to obtain uh, sensors. We're working with the Jefferson Project uh, at Lake George to help uh, model and analyze some of this data more intensely and then all of my former and current lab mates for assisting in the work.
With that, I will take any questions. Questions? Your photo on the left looks like a is that a cyanobacteria bloom or <laughs> there was a cyanobacteria bloom at the same time that we're deploying, so you can see this little yellow thing right here is a buoy at the top of our sensor line. Right. And so we were dunking our faces into the cyanobacteria bloom trying to deploy these sensors. Well, that, that prompts my question. Do you think there's any biotic effects of the stratification of events in the South Basin maybe tied to the occurrence of, of algal blooms? Yeah, with the um, onset of the stratification, uh, we have evidence that during those short stratification events, it is going anoxic, which means that there can be phosphorus release. And if during those short periods of, of stratification, there's phosphorus being released into the water column, as soon as that stratification breaks down, it's going to enter into the surface layers and allow the cyanobacteria to pick that up and uh, proliferate. So. Cool. <coughs> or not cool. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Good job. Thank you. Now a little closer to home, French Creek, and we're going to hear from Brianna Sebastian talking about in-stream habitat improvement. Hi everyone, my name is Brianna Sebastian. I am an assistant research scientist at Allegheny College's new Watershed Conservation Research Center, and today I will be talking about some of the restoration projects that we have going on in the French Creek watershed. So just a little background into French Creek. French Creek is a 117 mile long uh, stream that flows into the Allegheny River. Um, so that puts it in the Ohio watershed rather than the Erie watershed that we are located in right now. And it is a highly biodiverse system with loads of different fish species, including about 15 different species of darters, as well as our native brook trout and the brown trout also live there, as well as numerous species of macroinvertebrates, reptiles, and amphibians, like the hellbender that we have there in the center. Um, we have the river otters, as well as other semi-aquatic mammals, as well as numerous different species of mussels. I think there's about 27 different species of mussels that live in the French Creek watershed. Many of them are federally and state listed um, threatened and endangered mussels, including the snuff box that is listed there. Um, so with that, we wanna make sure that we are keeping French Creek healthy, which is some, one of the reasonings behind our restoration. Um, just some anthropogenic impacts that we can see on different freshwater systems. Uh, eutrophication in the form of a harmful algal bloom in Lake Erie, uh, other poor land use practices, you know, from runoff from farms. You can see some stream bank erosion in this photo. Uh, that was the result of some upstream development. Also, you know, these turbid sediment uh, siltation filled waters that uh, blocks out sunlight, causing further problems in the system. And of course, invasive species, like we have heard about the round goby today. And so these are all things that are, uh, we can see occurring in the French Creek watershed. And so that is another reasoning behind our restoration to help alleviate some of these um, problems. So just a little background into our project. We had several different um, partners with this project, including the Regional Science Consortium, as well as the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, the Crawford County Conservation District, and the landowners who allowed us on their properties. A couple of goals that we have for this project are to, of course, improve stream bank and in-stream habitat at two specific restoration sites. We have reduced sediment loading downstream of these sites collect bi-weekly water samples at several different locations in the French Creek watershed, and monitor those two specific restoration sites of long term through biotic surveys, 
and finally provide educational opportunities for Allegheny College students. So these two maps are showing, uh, the left map shows the French Creek watershed. You can see that outlined in black. And the French, and the French Creek watershed is about uh, 1,200 square miles large with French Creek down the center, like I said. And then our study area is really focused in the Woodcock Creek um, sub-basin of the French Creek watershed, and that's about a 50 square mile large area with Woodcock Creek in the center there, which is about 20 miles long, that flows into French Creek. And so you can see on the right hand here, our two restoration sites. The top site is what we call the Craig Road restoration site, and that is on the Woodcock, on Woodcock Creek. And then we have the Telly Ho restoration site, and that is on the tributary to Woodcock Creek. I have those two dots on the bottom. Those are some other restoration projects going on uh, through the Crawford County Conservation District. The left-hand dot um, is a culvert that was replaced last year, and then the dot on the right is a culvert that will be hopefully replaced next year. And these are included uh, because they are on that tributary. They're just upstream of the Telly Ho restoration site, and we did complete biotic surveys in these at these culverts as well, and we plan to monitor them into the future. So one of our goals, like I mentioned, was that bi-weekly water sampling in the French Creek watershed, and we collected samples bi-weekly from June through October, October at 11 different uh, locations within the French Creek watershed, and these locations were specifically chosen because ac accessibility, of course, but also because they were um, upstream and downstream of our two restoration sites, you can see Craig Road there in the green, and then the Telly Ho restoration site in the purple. And these samples were collected and then delivered up here to the Regional Science Consortium so that they can analyze these samples um, for nutrients in terms of nitrates and phosphates and bacteria. So another one of our goals was these biotic surveys. And we did these biotic surveys at the two restoration sites. And these surveys were completed along a 130 meter stretch at these two sites. And first we have the Telly Ho restoration site and we completed two pre-restoration surveys this past summer. But uh, this site was not, um, nothing has been done to this site yet so I won't talk about any of those results today. But you can see the stream bank, dramatic stream bank erosion happening at the, this site. And then we have the Craig Road restoration site we completed two pre-restoration surveys over the summer, and then we had um, two post-restoration surveys in the summer and fall after um, Craig Road was restored. And you can see these two photos are in the, from the spring before any restoration occurred. Um, you can kind of see some stream bank erosion here, and that channel has really widened over time. So going into our uh, methods for these biotic surveys, we completed a fish survey using backpack electrofishing and some netters um, along that 130 meter reach. And then the fish were identified, tallied, and then released outside the study area. We collected aquatic macroinvertebrates using a D-net at six different locations along this reach in um, three different habitats. And those macroinvertebrates will be identified over the winter, so I won't go into any of those results today. We collected basic water quality parameters, like including at one site at each of these, at one location at each of these sites, including um, temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, uh, total hardness, alkalinity, um, and conductivity. And then we collected substrate data along five different transects along this reach using a substrate board. And then finally, we collected uh, data on water velocity, width, and depth along five different transects along this uh, study, or along the reach as well. We also did riparian habitat evaluations just once at each of those sites, so I won't talk about those results today either. This happening. Okay, so Craig Road was restored um, the first week of August, and you can see the different habitat improvement structures that were implemented. The log frame stone deflector there at the top, and then the single log vein deflectors on the bottom there, 
In the center, you can see the crew constructing that root wad deflector, what it was called. And then on the left here, that root wad deflector was then um, filled in with gravel and rock and things like that. We also have a structure called modified mud sill cribbing, and that was implement, implemented along different uh, locations along that reach. And then the riparian area was then reseeded after all of these structures were implemented. Um, these two photographs show um, some differences at the restoration site going on before and during restoration. The left-hand photo was taken the morning of restoration before any work had been done. And the right-hand photo was taken during, during this restoration period where a lot of the um, work had already been done. You can see that modified mud sill cribbing filled in with rock, um, those single log vein deflectors, as well as already that stream flow has been altered a little bit and that um, gravel bar is diminishing a little bit because there were some really strange uh, water flow patterns under that bridge that you can see in the next photo here. And so this photo was taken two months after um, Craig Road was restored. And this was taken during one of our most recent biotic surveys. You can see, again, the mud silk cribbing, that diminished gravel bar, and that riparian area, all that grass is growing back in. So going into some preliminary results, because again, this was just from this year. Um, these results are from water sampling across those 11 sites. Um, and the top graphs are our nutrients and the bottom graphs are our bacteria. And they are divided into pre-restoration and post-restoration averages. And the order of the sites are more or less in order of flow. That Fisher Road site is all the way upstream um, in the tributary to Woodcock Creek. And then the last two sites on the left here are in French Creek. So more or less water flows that way. And while there are no significant trends, this was only done over the course of five months. Um, you can see, for the most part, it does seem like um, net, uh, nutrients and E. coli are reducing over time. There could be temporal reasons or restoration, um, but that does not seem to be the case for enterococci. It increased over time. So these two graphs are kind of zoomed in specifically on that Craig Road restoration site, and they are taken from the graphs before and kind of rearranged a little bit. And so what happened at each of our restoration sites, we collected two water samples, one all the way at the top of that 130 meter reach, which we called upstream, and one at the bottom edge of that 130 meter reach, which we called downstream. And so these are divided pre and post restoration with that dotted line indicating restoration. And you can see, for example, in this nitrates graph that you know, upstream and downstream were fairly similar, but nitrates did decrease downstream after, res after um, the restoration had been implemented. And that is similar with phosphates, but the opposite seems to be happening with that bacteria. But like I said, again, this was short term, could be for various reasons, weather patterns, things like that. So here are some more just preliminary results. Again, the dotted line indicates uh, restoration had occurred. And the bottom graphs are uh, discharge and percent of silt. And you can see the discharge seemed to decrease over time, but silt seemed to increase over time. Um, so while again not significant, uh, we hope to monitor these in the future. So these are some charts that are showing the different um, fish that we caught at each of these sites. So before restoration, we caught 31 different species of fish uh, for a total of 398 fish at those two pre-restoration surveys. And then after restoration, we caught only 28 species of fish for a total of 823 fish um, at those two post-restoration surveys. And the charts are just showing the different uh, fish families um, pre and post-restoration. Uh, you can see uh, pre-restoration, it was really dominated by that Persidae family, which are your darters and your uh, perch, and then followed by Cyprinidae, which are your minnows, and then Catastomidae family, which are your suckers. Um, but after restoration, those top three families did remain the same, but it kind of became a little bit more 
evenly dis distributed with Persidae, Catastomidae, and Cyprinidae. Um, and so for each of the fish families, the top three fish families, I pulled out that top um, species that was the most common. We had the fantail darter was the most common um, in the Persidae family beforehand. Then we had the rosy faced shiner and then the white sucker. And these remained fairly similar after restoration with the fantail darter as your most common darter species, followed by the northern hog sucker. And um, we think this could have been that we caught a lot of young of year at one of the sampling, at one of the sampling dates. And then the rosy faced shiner. So while we did lose species uh, before and after restoration, um, we hope in the long term that biodiversity does increase. So again, like I mentioned, there are no significant trends yet. This is a new project, and we hope to continue this project into the future, monitoring these sites for at least five years. It's where the WCRC can play an important role. Um, but it does seem that in general, there is a delay in response of these um, systems after restoration. So for example, um, this paper, Favada et al. found a specifically a three-year delay in response of fish biotic integrity after restoration. So just a couple, talking about a couple of the trends that we did see, even though they are not significant, um, could have been because of different weather patterns that we had. We had a drought this summer and then an increase of rain beginning of fall that could have impacted some of the flow that we saw. Um, the Craig Road restoration site is also downstream of the Woodcock Dam, and that dam is regulated by the Army Corps of Engineers, so uh, those water levels are pretty um, strictly regulated. And the outflow of the Woodcock Dam is also a really popular um, recreational fishing spot. And so with some of the fish trends we saw, we saw a lot of differences in fluctuations in the game fish species that we caught at each of those um, sampling periods, and that could be from wash out from um, the outflow of the Woodcock Dam. Um, some more trends that we saw, uh, of course, construction equipment was in the stream at that time, so those big construction vehicles could have impacted some of our more um, selective species. Uh, for example, the long nosed dace, we only caught before restoration. They really like swift, um, riffly habitats and um, that was only, they were only found near the bridge where that gravel bar was. And of course we implemented a lot of different structures there. So um, that could have impacted their habitat. So for future plans, of course, is to hopefully restore that Tele Ho site next year, next summer, maybe even find additional sites to restore. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are strengthening our community and landowner partnerships and continuing to engage Allegheny College students in field work and research. So with that, I would like to thank the Richard King Mellon Foundation for funding the WCRC and this project, the Regional Science Consortium, the Crawford County Conservation District, and the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission uh, for helping with this project. Of course, the landowners for supporting this project on their properties, and Allegheny College students for helping collect the data. Uh, any questions? Are there any known uh, populations of native mussels in the restored areas? Uh, Craig Road, yeah, we did sample the mussels in at Craig Road before restoration occurred. I can't, I don't know what species there we found only, there. There was only three species. But through permitting, we had to do it with uh, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. So, yeah, so there's no like, endangered ones yeah, there. Yeah, to make sure that because, it was a, because French Creek is a hot spot for mussels, it always lights up as being you can't get a permit to, yeah. to do stuff in the stream there. So you always have to have people come in um, that are permitted to, to go through. But yeah, I mean, spikes, um, mucket, um, yeah, just a couple of the, the regular ones. Thankfully, yeah. we didn't find any tea. Um, I believe these landowners were 
I mean, there was no issues with it. The, the landowner at Craig Road was at sam the sampling time periods each time, checking out all the fish that we caught. Um, so there were no issues with these two sites um, in terms of landowners. So thankfully with these two projects, we had um, funding from a couple of sources, and so the landowner didn't have to contribute any financial money towards these projects, and that obviously is a huge incentive. Um, you know, because these things are, can be $5,000, $10,000, $40,000. So um, I think when most of them are coming, and they're like, we're losing all of our land, like, you know, keep washing away, and so when we're like, well, we can we can help with that. And it's like, oh my gosh, thanks. Um, but of course, there's some pushback. I think there's more pushback, it seems like, when um, agencies approach them versus the college. Um, yeah, that's my perspective. <laughs> I, I know you said that you, you're going to be doing the analysis of the macroinvertebrates mm -hmm. over the winter. While you were collecting them, was there any sense of the, the macroinvertebrates before and after having changed? Before and after, it's hard to tell because um, sometimes students collected the macros, so different people collected them each time, so it's, oh, okay. it's really hard to tell right now. But that's a winter project. <laughs> Jacob Blister here. Jacob is our speed talk uh, scheduled for this time slot. We have a choice of either sitting around for 10 minutes or going on and getting out to lunch early. <laughs> Option two, right? <laughs> if Jacob comes in, we'll tack him on to the end. Our next speaker and the last speaker for this morning is um, Col uh, sorry. Col Col Hi. Kent State University. Oh, do you have the Oh, yes. So we're we'll back the next Perfect. Thank you. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Colton Hyatt. I'm an Earth Sciences undergraduate student with Kent State University. Over the summer, I was fortunate enough to have been selected for an internship with the Erie County Department of Health and the Ohio Space Grant Consortium. The scope of the project was to analyze small flow treatment facility effluent data collected by the Department of Health and to determine their effectiveness in reducing nutrient runoff before discharge to the environment. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what a small flow treatment facility is, how they contribute to harmful algae blooms, eutrophication levels, and the health concerns that come with them, the standards and limitations, uh, the data analysis I conducted, my results, and then the next steps of the study. So first off, what is a small flow treatment facility? So these are basically small wastewater management systems designed for rural areas. They're designed to treat up to 2,000 gallons of wastewater per day. Um, they basically take the place of traditional septic systems. They get installed in a backyard. Wastewater flows from the house to the system. It treats it, and then it releases it to the environment. Treatment is handled by a variety of methods along with disinfection. We have aeration, sand, and biological for the treatment, and then disinfection is handled via chlorine or UV. So this is an example of one of the systems in a house. This is a subsurface sand filter by one of the common manufacturers, Arenco. So we have the household, water flows from the household to the septic, from the septic to the sand filter, and then out to a disposal field. The disposal field disperses it over a large area. The sand filters, in, along with the biological filters, have or they grow a biofilm in them, and as the wastewater flows through the biofilm, bacteria breaks down the nutrients, and then the aeration filters just use aerobic um, bacteria to break down that wastewater. And then as it goes through the disinfection phase, UV or chlorine treats it for pathogens, so getting rid of things like E. coli. So this is a study region. This study took place here in Erie County. Uh, the Blue region up here is the Lake Erie watershed. The re red region is the French Creek watershed. Most of the systems were in the Lake Erie watershed, so that's the primary focus of this study. 
Uh, each of the stars on this map are one of the small flow treatment facilities themselves. Uh, there were 525 systems in this region, 253 of them were part of this study. After conducting quality assurance and quality control, that number dropped down to 192, which I'll go into here in just a second. So these were my methods. So again, as part of the Erie County Department of Health Oversight Management Program, every year sewage enforcement officers go out and conduct visual inspections of the small flow systems and then they take water quality samples which get sent off for analysis. So the parameters that they test for are biochemical oxygen demand, total phosphorus, total suspended solids, total residual chlorine, E. coli, and ammonia. The total residual chlorine is tested for on-site by sewage enforcement officers using a hatch colorimeter. And then water quality samples are sent to Prescott water testing for E. coli into the national lab for all the other parameters. So after they take all these samples, they get the results, they compiled it, they sent it to me for data analysis. Starting with the data analysis, I had to clean the data first. I had to conduct QAQC on it. Um, I had to remove qualitative values so that I could use statistical analysis. Um, I then, weighed them against the uh, limitations set by the EPA to find the attainment levels for the systems in treating the nutrients um, and reported that as averages and weighted values. And then I conducted a sensitivity study, which I did cut for this presentation, so I'm not gonna talk too much about that. So this was experimental design. Um, so initial review of notes with the data uh, revealed the Number of sampling concerns. Um, some of the biggest concerns of those were the actual outfalls themselves. These are outfall pipes. There is one right over here, you just kind of can't see it because it's underneath water. So these are problems when coming to sampling, uh, trying to get clean samples when you have outfall pipes that are down in mud puddles, you can't get a good sample off of that. If it's submerged in water, then you definitely can't get a good sample. We're just testing downstream, so those samples have already undergone dilution and potential contamination, et cetera, et cetera. So after reviewing the sites with sampling concerns, I had to cut 24% of those samples. So there's about a quarter of the samples removed because the samples were the entire site. I had to take out the entire site from analysis. Uh, <clears throat> I also had a lot of qualitative values included with my data. Um, some of these values include this TNTC. When testing for E. coli, that TNTC just means too numerous to count. That means there are too many E. coli bacteria to count in the sample. Um, when testing for attainment levels, that wasn't much of a concern as it just means it failed. So those systems that had too many to count were automatically counted as failures. In some Cases like the total suspended solids, that was a bit more of a problem, as the limitation is 20. So if it says something like less than 20 or less than something like that, I can't guarantee exactly where that falls. So oftentimes those counted as a failure as well. So that could be dropping our attainment levels. This is just a table showing the amount of samples that I had to cut from each category. So we see on the top are the different parameters, the ammonia, biochemical oxygen, demand, E. coli. On the left, we have our different combinations of filters. SC is sand filter with chlorine. SU is sand filter with UV. AU is aeration with UV. BU is biological with UV. And AC is aeration with chlorine. Um, again, had to cut about a quarter of the overall samples from analysis. They're about 20 to 33% removed by parameter type and about 0 to 48% removed by equipment type. And this goes over a little bit of the installation operations and management concerns that arose and gives an outline of some of the limitations. So 15% of the samples showed some sort of installation concern. These installation concerns could be anything from not being properly spec'd. So each system is designed on a case by case for the specific house or strip mall or golf course that it's being set up for. If it is permitted for a specific system and then a different system is installed, then odds are it's not working properly for that location and that leads to lower attainment levels. Um, operations and management concerns were those involving components not working. Some of these systems use UV lights to disinfect the treated wastewater. 
Uh, we have reports of some systems not having UV lights operating in three years, so three years of the UV light not working probably means it's not being treated very well. Um, so these were some of the concerns. I would like to note that we see 15% existed, and then after cutting the sampling concerns, that went down to 2%. So these concerns really didn't have much of an impact. It's just worth noting that this is something that should be addressed. There are also two different sets of standards for the systems. These are the EPA standards up top and then the National Sanitation Foundation standards on the bottom. So having two different sets of regulatory and manufacturer standards probably isn't a good thing. The EPA regulatory standards are stricter than the NSF manufacturer standards. It would be better if these were identical and manufacturers were building these systems off of the regulatory standards instead of their own standards. Um, I would like to note, of course, that in system testings, or in system testing with the manufacturers, most of the systems performed way better than these regulations require in the first place. So they were reporting values of like the t total suspended solids down to eight milligrams per liter, uh, biochemical oxygen demand down to about 10 to 12. So the system shouldn't be meeting it. This shouldn't be a, a big deal when it comes to that. These are the results of my study. So overall, we had 70% of systems, or we had the systems performing and meeting limitations in 70% of cases. Uh, the two best performing filters were the sand filters, uh, both with chlorine and with UV. They reached 75 and 73% attainment levels. Uh, aeration filters and biological filters with UV performed fairly similar to one another at 54 and 57%. The worst performing system was the aeration with chlorine system. I would like to note that this is like a, that low attainment rate probably has nothing to do with the actual system components itself. It has to do with the fact that there were only two systems in this study using that combination. If you look on the left, we can see the performance by system component. We get 49% performance out of aeration filters and uh, we get 69% out of chlorine when you use the different components, the systems work. In this combination, they didn't. That was likely had to do with the two specific sites that were actually tested. So why might some of these not be meeting the attainment levels? It could be that the equipment itself it cannot meet the limitations. That seems very unlikely. 70% of systems meet the limits, which means that they work. The systems work, the technology works, there's some other factors that are driving the rates down. Um, it could be that it's improper sizing of the actual equipment. As I mentioned, every location, every house, it has an inspector come out and determine which systems should be used in that site. So if they're not following those recommendations, if they're not sizing them appropriately to the house, then that could be a problem. The EPA estimates that a typical household uses 400 gallons per day of wastewater with an additional 100 gallons per day per additional bedroom. So each of these systems are sized for a specific loading rate into the system. If, if the house is reporting that it's only using 500 gallons per day of wastewater and then its system is set up for say 550 gallons per day and then it actually uses 700, it could be overloading these systems. And now the water's flowing too, through too fast, it doesn't actually have an opportunity to be treated. Operations and maintenance is also a likely contributor to lower attainment rates, as mentioned already. UV lights not working is a problem. Uh, most, most of the systems require some sort of monthly or annual maintenance. That monthly maintenance could be adding chlorine tablet systems that use chlorine, typically use a sodium hypochlorite tablet, and they average about one a month. In inspecting some of these systems, we've seen multiple tablets stacked on top of one another. The problem with that is the weight of the tablets on top crush the one on the bottom, and it releases far more chlorine into the actual system, which creates chloramines and is hazardous, and extra chlorine is bad. So my recommendations, first off, are education. Educational workshops could be useful in uh, interviews between sewage enforcement officers and the homeowners that use these systems. Homeowners are very interested in doing the right thing. They don't want to have an impact on the environment. Um, 
giving them more information to know how to use the systems properly or how to set up the systems properly uh, could be beneficial. Could also do this using annual trainings and annual training workshops and webinars. Uh, during the permitting process, we can have uh, homeowners going through the same workshops. Um, outreach events at public events is a good one, or symposiums like this, so that you can spread the word of what small flow systems are and what they do. <clears throat> and then, of course, cost benefit analysis, letting uh, homeowners know the difference in pricing between the two and are they really saving more money. Um, we could also comment this with policy change. So in terms of policy change, incentive programs for compliance would be a great thing. As of right now, if you pass your inspection every year, you don't get anything for it. Some sort of tax credit or rebate for meeting attainment levels would be good. Um, possible repercussions for non-compliance could also help. Of course, you want to lead with the carrot, but if the carrot doesn't work, then give them the stick. <laughs> Um, and then standardizing, of course, those limitations. Again, there's a difference between the EPA regulatory and the NSF manufacturer standards. If we had those identical, then the systems might get designed a little bit better, but that didn't seem like the bigger problem there. Um, sampling concerns would, of course, be one of them. Again, a lot of the samples aren't collected properly, and that's nothing against the Department of Health themselves. That's how the systems are actually set up in the first place having the outfall sewers being located underneath water is not gonna help us with sampling. So getting uh, better sampling methods, this could even be putting a nozzle at the end of the PVC pipe so that we can get underneath it and get a sample from a better place than the end of the outfall. Um, additional sensors that monitor these systems digitally could also help. Uh, this gives the Department of Health an opportunity to keep real-time monitoring on the small flow systems and when they recognize some sort of malfunction, they can get with the homeowner about getting that fixed first. Um, of course, this all comes with money, so I'd recommend a higher budget for the Department of Health. Uh, there is some information kept in paper records at the Department of Health that would be useful to me specifically. Um, part of my next steps is going to be trying to quantify exactly how much nutrient loading these small flows actually put into the water systems and all the flow rate records for the individual houses are kept in paper records so digitizing these records would be very beneficial to me going forward um, more frequent sampling as of right now the oversight program only requires sampling annually if we could get more sampling out more frequently then that could be helpful, of course, that requires more personnel as it is. Um, increased budget could also provide screens for the outfalls and to help cut back on uh, contamination of our samples, um, things like leaves and stuff falling down into the systems, the screens could be helpful for that too. Um, I'm currently just doing round one of our data. The Department of Health has also uh, compiled and sent me round two and round three data for the following two years, and then some older data that we called round zero data, which is a much smaller data set. So I'll be able to analyze these sets as well. Um, and then as I just mentioned, I'm currently working on building a watershed map um, using GIS to figure out exactly where all these small flows are going, where the nutrient runoff is going, and what systems they're impacting the most. Any questions? accessibility to the kind of information that is revealed by your study? I know for, like, there's an online website called How's My Waterway where you can find, you know, any permitted discharges to waters. Would these small flow systems be working under NPDES permits? And they are. Identified on How's My Waterway? I'm not sure about How's My Waterway. I've actually never heard of that one. As far as I know, they are part of the MPD's um, permitting process. Uh, they also have a water quality management um, permit as well associated with them. I don't know of any sort of databases where you can just go in and find all that information, but I could look more into that because that would be helpful. Yeah, because if people knew that their 
violations were publicly known, mm -hmm. that might be a, a motivator that's in between carrot and stick, you know? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that's why I led with the education. I feel like just simply making sure everybody knows what these systems are and what happens if you don't follow the, you know, monthly maintenance and whatnot would be good. I think that would raise the attainment levels. I mean, having a UV light not working for three years is a pretty simple fix. You just open it up, pull it out, and swap the new light, but it hasn't been done. So that could have to do with education not knowing what exactly you're not doing when you don't change that, or it could have to do with just not caring, of course, and some people just don't care. So more information is good. Other questions? Yes. Um, thanks for putting that plug in about the health department budget. I hope some lawmakers are, are watching. I hope somebody um, sees it. <laughs> um, in your research, did you find any other um, agencies that were providing like those digital sensors for house for households? No, we just started looking into it. We haven't seen a whole lot. Uh, Dr. Ortiz, the professor I'm working under, I know he was reviewing some sensors that the Department of Health might use. So. I think he sent recommendations over to Erie County Department of Health already. I could look more into it. Oh, that's her. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. Um, are, are you from Ohio? Actually? Yes, I'm from Kent State, Ohio. It, does Ohio have a similar system as Pennsylvania for, for monitoring these kinds of small closed systems? Do you know? It's a really good question. I'm not too sure. Um, since I started this study back in May, I've mostly just been looking at Pennsylvania. I'm not from Ohio either, so I don't know much about Ohio. <laughs> so. <laughs> Around here, you know, I would ask you that one, Dr. Benini. <laughs> um, if I remember, it has something to do with the soils, um, and I can't remember. Was it too much clay in the soil? Clay too much clay in the soil, right? right? What's that? We have a lot of clay around here, right? Right, and lots so of clay. What's the problem with clay? Water doesn't flow through clay. Yeah, so a traditional septic system, you're going to discharge into the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And around here, a lot of the area around here, you might give me four inches of really good kind of topsoil. Mm. Right? You need about 20 inches of topsoil here in order to like install a right. yeah. traditional septic system. That's why a lot of septic systems around here that were installed back in the 70s and 80s, they're not really up to code. And so a lot of people have to move towards these uh, small flow systems. So um, I think we can. I think mean, on your first slides there, you had shown we had 525 small flow systems. That's true as of last year. Uh, we're up to 555 now. 555. Um, my, my started this job a couple years ago, we had 470. So these are increasing at a very fast rate now. Um, just wanted to point that out. Thank you. It seems though it's on that 
homeowner, landowner, is there anything in between? I mean, are there like kind of neighborhood, small treatment plants? Right? I, mean, I, I mean, it's mostly used in residential settings. There are cases of them being used for churches, strip malls, golf courses. So, I mean, there are some that treat a couple properties, but for the most part, it is just the, the houses, residential houses. So I'm thinking of like really small scale, like what we're doing down along the bayfront, right? At, mm. at our wastewater treatment plant, mm. are, are there models that might serve 100 houses or something like that? Of these small flows, no. No, they, they're only designed to treat up to 2,000 gallons per day, so they certainly could. And that's at most five small houses in one. They shouldn't be treating much larger areas like that. And that's when you get more into just the you know, municipal waste management systems. Right. I guess I guess what I was asking, are there small scale like municipal oh, systems? Not entirely sure. I I would imagine there's probably some in between the small flows for the residential houses and the actual city ones, but I think that's a large part of what the these are supposed to address are those locations where there's not that in between where there's not something so at least they get something instead of just a cesspool out in the backyard. Yeah, I think trailer parks typically have yeah. little sewage treatment plants. Yeah. yeah, those would be in between. But they're close. This is probably a function of houses being far apart in really rural areas. Right. right? And, and sewer systems just are mm -hmm. not, are, yeah, cost prohibitive. Right, you're, exactly. You know, like tapping into it. Yeah. OK, thank you. All right, thank you. We have two bits of good news. The first bit is we're over a little bit earlier and you can get to lunch. And the second thing is lunch is available in the cafe over across the entrance way. See you this afternoon. Thank you.